So first, I need everybody to stand up. Calisthenics. Calisthenics, yes. Okay, I'm gonna count to five, and while I'm counting to five, I need you to do your coolest dance move. You ready? Okay, here we go. Ready, set, go. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. Okay, you can sit back down. So that had a point, and here's my point. I want to know, how did you guys react to my request? What all did we see? Confused, shocked, uncomfortable, hesitant, what? Incredulous. Some people were enthusiastic, delighted, Marginally accepted? Grudging acceptance. Okay. There were some refusals, right? There were some people who didn't do it. So, the reason I made you do that is, I think that's what our students feel like when we say, you're gonna stand up at the board and you're gonna do a proof in math in front of all of these people. Some of whom you may know and you want them to keep liking you. Some of whom you may not know and you want them to like you. Some of whom you may know and you don't really care if they like you anyway. So I think you get some students who are really excited. They're delighted. They are natural teachers. They like to talk in front of people. They're confident. They want to go to the board. They want to prove. But then you've got these students who are like, I'm not doing it. Nope, not going to do it. I'm just going to stand here. Why? Because I might go to the board and fail, and that's terrifying, and I don't want to do that. I might do it, but I'm not going to give it my full effort. I'm going <laughs> to. That's about it. You may also have students that are like, I don't do that unless I'm drunk. I only prove once I'm drunk. <laughs> that happens with dancing a lot, right? You may get some of this grudging acceptance, which I would say is better than refusal. If you can get them to go from refusal to grudging acceptance, they'll slowly work their way to maybe enthusiasm. So why, why did anyone do it? Why did anybody dance? Ah, I'm an authority figure. Everyone else was doing it. Everyone else was doing it. <laughs> I love dancing. Love dancing. I trust you have a reason for asking. Trust I have a reason. Whew, that's dangerous, Brian. <laughs> so I think those are also reasons, some of them we're trying to break, right? I tell my students that when you come into my Intro to Proofs class, it's no longer good enough to trust me. Unless I say it's an axiom, it's not, long, it's not good enough. Just because I say it, that doesn't mean you have to believe it. Sort of what I do in all my college classes, right? You turned 18, now you have to own everything you actually believe. So saying somebody else told you that, not a good enough reason anymore. So authority figures. I'm sort of trying to work myself out of that role. Authority figures maybe give you an idea of a direction to go in. Maybe they tell you something, but you have to own it before you say yes or no to it. Everyone else was doing it can be powerful or it can be terrible, right? If your class mutinies, man, it stinks that everybody's doing it. But if you've got five students who are super enthusiastic and everyone else gets enthusiastic, yes, peer pressure all the way, I'm sold. Some people do love dancing. You're, you, those are the kids you really like, right? And intro to proofs, the kids that are like, this is so cool that we get to interact, I wanna do this. And trusting I have a reason. So Brian has met me maybe like what, I don't know, two or three times? Enough to maybe trust me. You'll always have some students, at least my school is a small school, so I have some students who've had me before. They know there's probably some sort of method to my madness, but then I've also got students who've probably never seen me, and they don't know if I have a reason. So if I just tell them to go do something on the board, they don't trust me. If I just tell them that it's okay to go to the board and get it wrong, they don't trust me. They don't know if I might actually mock them. And more than me, they don't know about the rest of the people, right? It's really terrifying. I went to a workshop, Judith, not Judith, Carol, sorry. Oh, you can have credit if you want. Um, Carol did where it was on real analysis and she handed us some, some worksheet, it was for next. And you're looking at it and I have never been that terrified in my life because now I'm in a room of people who all have PhDs, some of them in real analysis. And I'm trying to work on this and she's like, okay, now let's go to the board. There was no way you were getting me to the board. And it was maybe the first time that it clicked with me like, oh my God, this is how my students feel. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of all of these people I think are experts. And that makes me very hesitant. 
So um, Ed mentioned last night that he puts failure into his syllabus. And that's something I've done. I've told my students that you have to fail to pass this class. And I think that's a good thing to emphasize to them because everybody's gonna fail. We're all gonna do stupid stuff. After you've been in class a little bit, you can pick out the one student that's maybe smart enough and good enough to handle it if they say something stupid. I had a student, we had just learned that the derivative of all constants is zero. And I said, what's the derivative of two? And he yelled out, two! And I said, well, he's done it. He said the stupidest thing possible. So now anybody else can say anything they want because he took that burden off of you. Isn't that nice of him for the rest of the semester? You guys can say whatever you want. Nobody needs to be scared. And this kid was, luckily, I knew him from a semester before. He was great. So whenever somebody would be like, I'm not sure I'm right, he's like, it's not two. Go for it. <laughs> Worked well. So last night when I was trying to think, and yeah, it was last night. I've been thinking about this for a while. But it was last night when I was making my decision. I wanted to do a mock intro to proofs class. That's what I promised you all. I thought, OK, but these people are going to know intro to proofs. I mean, you may not come back immediately, but you're going to be able to do most of the problems. I thought, I need somebody to be kind of like the dumb student. I, thought, I don't know that any of this audience can do it. And then I thought, I'm a perfect candidate. I'm great at playing the dumb person. I don't even have to really act. So what I did, I bought my students' finals from my discrete class, which serves as our intro to proofs. And I've copied out nine problems, which is why you have to be in nine tables. So if you're not in nine tables, you have to sort of adjust around. Um, thanks, ma'am. And they're all different. Just call me Carol. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> there you go. So what I want you guys to do, none of these are totally correct proofs. Some of them are correcter than others. I want you as a table to read through the proof and decide if this were put on the board in your class, how you would respond to it, what sort of questions you would ask the student to try and get them to fix things or point them to something without being directive. And I want you, what we're going to do is sort of groups. I don't know that we'll make it through everyone. We don't have that much time. But hopefully this will give you some sort of feeling of how to model it. And I'm going to play the dumb student. So if you give me corrections, I'm going to make them on the Elmo up here. And I'm going to do what you tell me to. So. Hopefully that helps. So take about five minutes, and I'll let you guys get to that. So yeah, take the next two minutes. Make sure your group knows what feedback you would give. A student just wrote this all on the board. You're the only one in the room. How are you going to tell them to fix it? Are we in office hours right now? We could be, sure. Is office hours better? But yeah, there's no other students, so. Yeah, if you have, if your group has your feedback ready, one of you can go get in line at one of the mics. You got to send a representative. All right, I'm calling time. So, PJ's ready. So is I'm Rob. sorry. Rob. Rob. Okay, Rob's ready. Rob, you got to tell me first. Oh, this was a call. number four. Which initials does it have next to it? H E. It's not a he. That's a student's initials, by the way. The problem here says for x, y, and r to find x relates to y to mean that x minus y is in z and prove that tilde is an equivalence relation. Fundamentally, the problem on this whole page is that the definition is never really invoked. Nowhere does it say anything about being an integer in any of the three parts. But the, why does an integer have to come into it? Well, I mean, because I said x minus y equals x minus y. That's um, look like before. Well, the fir the first one's actually a bigger problem than the other. Symmetric and transitive are basically right, but reflexive is a bigger. What what does reflexive mean? 
That I meant x minus y equals x minus y. No. Reflexive would mean that we can put the tilde between x and itself. X would relate to x. Okay. So what would that mean? Look up at the definition. Okay. What does it say that means? Mm. There, oh, there we go. There's something. The x minus x to x minus x doesn't really tell me much, but the zero, that's good. X, my, x relates to x means x, well, we know that x minus x is zero. Okay. What is zero? What kind of number is zero? It's not positive or negative. It's even. Yeah, but that doesn't have anything to do with our definition. What does our definition say? With that? There we go. Zero being an integer. So we follow the definition here. We know x relates to x because zero is in z. Okay. So that's enough for reflex. Does no, my group, does that, does that sound good for part one? You good on it? All right. All right, so that's part one. And part one was the biggest problem. Here we go, okay. X minus Y is not zero. True, true. Well, I mean, we don't know that for sure, but probably not. But okay. our definition doesn't say zero, it just says an integer. Is zero the only integer? No. no. Now, the, the steps here are basically right, although I'm not sure what you mean by this consider line. X relates to Y, relates to Y, relates to, I don't quite follow that. I don't know what I meant either. All right, well, the relation, equivalence relation, would be between two elements in R. X and Y are real numbers. It might be good to say X and Y are real numbers, but. I maybe mean this. Yes, that's what we want to show, certainly. We want to show X relates to Y implies Y relates to X. Okay, that's, that's much better. We haven't shown it yet, but it, that's our goal. All right, so time out so another person can get in. Good job. Okay. <laughs> the other two are basically right because you lower justification. This, this student, I'm not talking to the mic and I'm going to yield at. So this student happens to be one of the students who was very, very good in the class. I picked her worst one off of her final, so sorry. Um, and it wasn't until after I gave the final that it dawned on me why they all did this. My entire class, except for two people, did this proof exactly this way. The, the only equivalence relation they asked me about at the review session was a mod. Prove something was divisible by three mod something, or this or that. So they were all used to doing, okay, we take this one minus this one, and I can show it's equal to something divisible by three. Ta-da, we're done. So that was my fault for not showing them enough of these to really understand what an equivalence relation means. Um, this one startles me a little bit because it means they couldn't parse definitions as well as I wanted them to. Um, but yeah, my, my only suggestions to you would be try to avoid the world problem wrong. Um, Dana Ernst always says you have to be Mr. Frickin' Positivity, and that's exactly it. So I learned it as called, pardon my French, a shit sandwich. If you watch something like what not to wear. They do this a lot. You say a nice thing, a bad thing, and a nice thing, and they come off with a nice thing. So, you know, that dress color looks beautiful on you. I think we could get a better fit, but this is so much better than what you were wearing, isn't it? <laughs> and you leave with like, oh my God, I'm on the right track. So that's all you have to do for them. Like, you know, you did symmetric and transitive pretty well. You've got some good ideas. I think we maybe need to go through the definition a little bit more, but this is a really solid start. And that student leaves the board with like, I did pretty well. I got this. All right, Karen Bliss, which one did you have? Number two, H-E. Oh, we're picking on poor Heather. Oh. Um, so I was looking through this, and it seems like it has like most of the structure for induction. Um, but I did get a little bit confused at a couple places. Um, and so one of the things that I do when I get confused is maybe look at a particular instance. 
So if this is a statement that we believe is true for all n, maybe it would make sense for us to just pick out a particular n and like work with that. Um, and, and so let's imagine we're talking about for a moment n equals, well, let's just start with n equals two. So the statement that you have thus, three divides n cubed plus two n. So if n equals two, what do we have there? Didn't realize I was gonna have to multiply. No. Yeah, you're on the spot. You could do this. You could do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and so it is true that three divides 12, right? So before you look at anything else going on in your paper, remind me, how does induction work again? So what we know is that the statement is true for n equals two. What's the next? I think I wanna look at n equals three. Um, so we know it's true for n equals two, and we hope to find that it works for n equals three, right? We wanna show that it works for n equals three? Okay. Okay, so you wanna somehow build on the n equals two statement and show that it works for n equals three. And I think if you look at your next line down, so what, or maybe we should even step back up to like, what is the K up there that you're talking about? N cubed plus two oh, N one. equals three K. It's some integer. Okay. But I, I know, I, I'm reading through this again and I know that you can't use the same K. Oh, okay. That would mean they were equal to the same thing and that's not right. Cause this isn't equal. So what if I just make it N? Does that make everything better? <laughs> You look like you're maybe hesitant on that. Should, yeah. should it be N? I'm kind of just trying to make it look better at the board. <laughs> <laughs> what would be wrong if it was N? I mean, is there, is there a problem with using N again? I used M. Oh, you have M there. Oh, I'm sorry. But, but now that I'm here, I'm thinking, and I feel like a couple classes ago, Somebody else was at the board and we said there was a problem with already saying this here. Because is that that thing where I'm assuming what I want to prove? That's what, that's what it looks like to me. So what if I get rid of this size? No. Okay, so can you read that sentence then? The sentence says thus. Thus, n plus one cubed plus two times n plus one equals this, Wait, equals oh, that. Okay. okay. If I get rid of this side, and then maybe I can pull a three out of there. Oh, sorry. For the last, for the last three seconds. Okay. For the last three seconds, I'll have them. Okay. So, I mean, is, am, I, am I okay up to there, though? Okay, so we have some stuff going on there to get to that point. Remind me again, I wanna step back, like what was the big picture about induction again? I use that this is true. Oh, yeah, I remember what you told us now. I have a toolbox. In my toolbox, I have one hammer, and it's this. <laughs> I'm and if that's the only thing I got, I, I gotta you. hammer this part. <laughs> so I gotta, oh, and I see, I see it. There's one, there's that, okay. I, th I think I see part of it. I think I can get it maybe. And Judith is standing up, which means it's time for me to stop. So, thanks for coming to my mock intro to proofs class. If you have any questions, I know I'm out of time, but I'll be here until tomorrow at noon, hopefully. Unless I. <laughs>